Hi, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. My name is Farid. Um, uh, hi. Uh, I'm a volunteer with uh, People's Kitchen, uh, and I've also been uh, helping out with uh, the petition that, as you all know, are going to be on the ballot now. <laughs> I hate elections usually like I don't like ever vote for candidates although the first candidate I vote for was infinite where's infinite <laughs> right there <laughs> and uh, since that campaign like uh, I vote on ballot questions because I do think that's uh, that's democracy it's important um, so tonight we have several uh, ballot questions that's gonna be uh, presented we have uh, Question number two, which is the carbon impact. Um, and we have uh, the community control of the police. We also have Proposition Zero, question eight. Anybody, is there any other? There's like, there is like controversies in almost like in every one of this. Um, you know, like the, the redistricting map is unfair and there's concerns about that. I wish we had people who could present on like their objections. Um, but the seemingly benign question of, of carbon impact, uh, it's, I thought it was suspicious. And as it turns out, there are actually legitimate concern about uh, that question. And I will uh, hand it over to... I'm sorry, what's your name? Ashley and Nick. Ashley and Nick. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to us tonight. You know, we have grave concerns about ballot measure two. Can you all hear me okay? We're concerned because you read it, and it sounds absolutely marvelous. I mean, the question asks voters to vote to impose a fee on fossil fuel heating systems and new buildings for the purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now that sounds like a great thing that I'm concerned everyone is going to vote for. The problem with it is the ballot measure says a fee will be imposed on fossil fuel heating systems and not on renewable systems. And the problem is that the ballot question doesn't tell voters what renewable systems are so it's really misleading in that way you have to dig through city ordinances to discover the things that the city considers to be renewable and those include biomass burning wood at the McNeil plant or in individual stoves biofuels and what else? There's one other thing. Renewable natural and gas. renewable natural gas, which is a total scam. Renewable natural gas, its primary component is methane, which is the same as natural gas. Natural gas is also methane. So it has the same carbon dioxide emissions when you burn it as burning regular natural gas. Yeah, worse. You're right. So we're concerned because these things that are renewable actually put more greenhouse gas emissions into the air than burning gas or even coal. And they also emit harmful air pollutants that are hazardous to people's health. Ashley, do you have something you'd like to add? Well. I'll just mention that we've got some small, um, I'll, I'll grab them maybe and show you some little quarter page uh, sheets over there on that table. We've got an informational event next Sunday that we're organizing at the, on North Prospect Street at the Friends um, Community Center. And we're gonna be showing um, a film, a short film, and then we're just gonna be discussing ballot item two to offer some additional information about it would love to have a carbon fee. I think that'd be terrific, but it needs to be done right. Um, the, the fact that we have this sneaky little bit about 
really polluting false climate solutions in there. Really, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Oh, is that right? I will speak up. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, and then plus the mask. So, um, so the sneaky little bit about renewables being uh, exempt from that carbon tax is uh, is wrong, and we need to defeat this ballot item. So, if you're interested in getting more information about it, then please join us next Sunday at three o'clock at the North Prospect Street Friends. Um, community center and we can give you more information about it. I also just want to mention, um, and I won't take much more of your time, but to, in my mind this gets back to the really underhanded um, bit that happened when Burlington used to have a climate action plan, right? There was a climate action plan. No longer. Our climate future was placed in the hands of Burlington Electric and we now have this net zero roadmap and it's bullshit. So what we get from that is, yes, we're gonna electrify everything, but what that will do is it will increase emissions from McNeil, which are not currently counted, 453,000 453, tons in 2021 alone. Um, that could get up to a million tons of CO2 emissions in any given year. And that's just wrong. So I, I mention that because we need to take back our climate action plan. We need to take back our climate future and we need to get Burlington to count all emissions in this city, including McNeil, and then reduce them and put a plan in place to reduce them. We should have solar panels on every roof in this city. We should have geothermal. We should have clean, healthy heat and power, period. And Burlington needs to start getting on board with this. So anyway, I won't take any more of your time. And uh, thanks for letting me speak. And I'm not sure what to do with this. <laughs> thanks so much. Again, we have flyers over here. Um, can the people who are farthest from me hear me even if I'm wearing a mask? Is that okay? Yeah. Sweet. Okay. So, um, Proposition Zero, also known as Ballot Item Number Eight. Does everybody have our little flyer? If you don't have one, they're over there. Please grab one. Um, so, basically, the thing that I like to start off by saying is that the powers that this charter change would enable um, actually exist in nearly every other city and town in Vermont. Uh, what are those powers? It's the powers to do kind of three things. Um, the first uh, is to propose, and so I kind of think this is the most exciting part, it's the proactive part. Let's say you have an idea, something you really care about, you can propose ordinance. Uh, so let's say you want to uh, bring more funding back to our NPAs <laughs> and you want to create that as a proposition. You can, uh, you can per create that um, as a petition. You run around Burlington. You get 5% of qualified voters to sign that petition saying, like, I think that's a good idea too. It goes to city council. They have an opportunity to deliberate on it and say yes, they pass it, or no, they don't. Or maybe they say yes, and then the mayor vetoes it, right? At that point, in our current system, things just like die, right? But what this says is that you showed enough of Burlington is interested in this idea. It should get to go on the ballot, and Burlington should get to have the final say. And so uh, it would go on the ballot, and then if the majority of Burlington says like, hey, I think this is a good idea, and passes it, then it becomes ordinance. Uh, so it just gives like a little bit more people power in that way. 
It also enables two other powers that are maybe a little bit less exciting, but you know, I'll mention them anyway. <laughs> so the first is that uh, being able to ask advisory questions on the ballot. What's an advisory question? Uh, it's just sort of like a temperature check. So for example, in the past, there's been advisory questions like how the city feels about F-35s, uh, that kind of thing. It doesn't actually do anything. It just like gives you a sense of how, how your neighbors feel. Uh, currently, uh, you are able to petition to put an advisory question on the ballot. You run around, you could do all of that work. You can get 5% of voters sign that petition and bring it to city council, and then they could just dismiss it. This happened with City Hall Park. They got enough, like way more than enough signatures to get that on the ballot, and uh, city council decided they vetoed it and didn't put it on the ballot. So what this would do is say, like, if you got enough signatures, it should get to go on the ballot. And then the third power is actually not new. <laughs> we already have it. We have it through uh, the Vermont Constitution, um, and it's the ability to um, ask city council uh, to repeal or reconsider a decision that they've made if they've like passed an ordinance. So for example, like the sale of Burlington Telecom, we actually could have a petition to have that repealed if we had acted within 45 days. Uh, so that's not anything new. We're just like surfacing it so that Burlingtonians know that they have it. So those are kind of the three powers. The thing that I think uh, is really helpful to know is that this was actually passed by the voters of Winooski in 2015 um, and then had to go to the Vermont legislature and they deliberated on it and approved it and we're just stealing their language. So, uh, woo! And we're looking forward to you know, keeping an eye on what they're doing to continue to make this a really smooth process and make sure it's one that is by Burlingtonians for Burlingtonians and we will want to continue to like, adopt the changes that, or you know, things that they're continuing to add to this uh, as well. So I think that's everything. That's the basic gist of it. <laughs> Anybody have a question? Yeah. Does the legislature have to approve? Thank you. Does the legislature have to approve this if we pass it? Yes. But since they already approved Winooski's in 2015, it seems likely that they would. Unless people pull lots and lots of strings. Sure. And I think the other piece is if we can show like it passes by like a landslide in Burlington, that helps. <laughs> so city charter, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, like when you do update your phone, like uh, uh, update the operating system. So the city charter is like that basic laws that govern the city, but only the legislature actually can change it. Um, th there the two ways like we can ask them to change it is by the petition. And then also the city council can put something on the ballot that asks to change the, the charter. Um, so the city, the legislature, they're gonna look at it. The same thing, what go, it's gonna happen with the community control police. So which we, I, honestly, like I, I, I think it, it, it doesn't go far enough, but, um, but the legislature is probably gonna change that. Uh, they are working on police oversight, for example, like at the state level. So we'll see like what they're gonna do with it. They can do whatever they want. Like once, once like it's, is presented because it's going to be presented as a bill. And we do have uh, our champions in the legislature, Brian Cena, who was here earlier, uh, and uh, several other legislators. They, they, uh, they will fight for us to make sure we get uh, the, 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 ballot, uh, the, 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 the bill approved. So I, don't, I think most, since most of Vermont already has this in their charter, and if you hear California being mentioned or Oregon, or even Brexit, I've heard like, this is gonna be like Brexit. Go to everyone but Burlington.com. It's not like California, it's more like Vermont because South Burlington has it, Montpelier has it. Any of the objection that's been raised, uh, it's, oh, there's Brian right there. <laughs> Any of the objection that's been raised, like mostly people focus on, they bring up California, like because I guess it's, it's supposed to be bad because it's, it's a mess there. But we're talking about a city of 50,000 versus a state of like 20 something million with 500 different municipalities of varying rules. So it's more like Winooski, it's more like Rutland, it's more like, actually, let's not go with Rutland, <laughs> like, although they do have it, but it's more like Winooski, Montpelier, um, all the cities in Vermont except for Burlington has these rules already. So. And I'll just add to that. Um, 
I think something that can kind of throw people off is the 5% can sound either really big to some people or really small to some people. But for context, that's about 2,000 signatures. Um, you actually have to get more than 5% because a lot of them are going to get thrown out um, as like not valid signatures because someone like moved where they were living or <laughs> whatever. Or they weren't actually registered to vote. So you actually have to get quite a bit more. And that took us like over a year to do that. That's a lot of organizing. So it's, I think the concerns about things just like flooding the ballot uh, takes a lot of work to get that amount of signatures. And even still, 5% is just to get it on there. But then if it goes on the ballot, the majority of Burlington has to want this for it to pass. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else has other like questions or whatever? What's the first thing you would do with Proposition Zero? What's the first thing you would want to do? Fund NPAs? <laughs> I would like toast it first. <laughs> I would drink <laughs> to it. Uh, I think like the NPA probably is like the the the, the one that has all, the most support. I don't know if everybody is familiar with the NPA. It's the it's called uh, the Neighborhood Planning Assembly. So this is the, the neighborhood level institution of decision making and uh, public input that was created when Bernie became mayor. Um, so he, his, his victory was by 10 votes, so it was like this freak accident that, uh, that then like the established powers in the city really tried to suppress, like they thought they could just wait him out. So they block all his appointees, like they block every, any uh, proposal that Bernie had. And so uh, part of the way Bernie got around that challenge is by creating CEDO, the Community and Econo of, uh, Community, Community Economic Development Office. Uh, and so started, he started uh, channeling the money towards CEDO, and CEDO in turn uh, also created the NPAs. So if you have not uh, gone to an NPA in your ward, every ward has an NPA, and it is uh, very grassroots, it's very directly democratic. Uh, one person, one vote, NPAs can create resolutions, um, and it used to have a lot more power. The, uh, neighborhood Planning Assembly. So they usually have a m monthly meeting, uh, and you, it's the same day and same time, like every month. Uh, and they used to be a lot more powerful. Like when Bernie first, uh, w w during the Bernie era, they had at least like fifteen thousand dollar budget. At the, uh, in, this is in the eighties, so they were able to do many things, many like innovative things. Um, a lot of like the best things that Burlington is known for as the result of this kind of neighborhood level, like grassroots decision-making uh, ability that Burlington uh, has pioneered. And unfortunately, in the last 10, 15 years, the, the administration has actively sabotaged this process. Um, they have been defunded, so now like the budget is 800 something dollars, I think. Um, and there is, uh, it doesn't have the same power a as it used to, partly because they, it's not as efficient to manage. Uh, is the, one of the reasons that I've heard. Uh, and you know, our several city councilors have said, if people are happy, they won't come out and vote. They won't come out. You know, like that just like the, the the fact that the low attendance at the NPA or even turnout during the election, they take it as a sign that everybody is happy with the way things are. So. It's, I think it's a little convenient, <laughs> too convenient, but um, it's hard because we also don't have that much power, right? Like, we, we do elections, and then what do we do? We just choose between people who could afford to run to make all the decisions for us. And that's why I think, like, Proposition Zero was, is very important. Uh, and the pushback that we've received, I thought, I didn't, I didn't expect it. I thought, like, because most of the people we talked to when we were collecting signatures were like, oh, really? We don't have that already? It's such a no-brainer. But, and I thought this was like, this was a bug in our operating system, but no, it's like, it's a feature. <laughs> to, like, to the powers that be, they like it. This is what they want. They want to be making all the decisions. We have, what, 12 people now? Just like, be, you know, it's like, it's, that's it. That's, that's, that's the only people who, could get, who get to make the rules in Burlington, it's like, when you think about it. Is that democracy? You know, it's like, is that representative? So I think you know better what you want. You know better. We could, we could work together to come up with what we need.
And uh, so we just need the power to do it. So. It could also be a pathway for things like participatory budgeting or citizen assemblies. Um, and I bring that up as a point because sometimes people will say, well, there's so many ballot items. How can people get educated and really make an informed uh, vote? But for example, I believe this is in Oregon. They actually have a citizen assembly that they create, which a citizen assembly is like a random lottery of people, like, like you're, you're pulled for jury duty, <laughs> okay? And then they present all these different sides for each ballot item. And then the citizen assembly uh, prepares a report out on how they advise people to vote on each ballot item. You can do whatever you want, but now you have this perspective from uh, your neighbors who got really informed on the topic. So there's a lot of ways to go about that um, to make sure that people feel comfortable with whatever gets put on the ballot. Anyways. Any more questions? Yes, so we are trying to fundraise for to do like the mailing. It it does take take money. Uh, we uh, we're talking to some organizations, which hopefully could uh, help us defray some of the costs. But we also will be accepting donations because we're gonna be registered as a public question committee uh, with the Secretary of State. So. Um, Please let us know your contact information before you leave so we can get in touch with you. Uh, and especially if you're willing to help uh, spread the word, like talk to your neighbors, maybe have a lawn sign that you could put on, that would be great. I think the, the ballots are going to start coming out this week and some people are going to vote right away through the mail. So we're trying to uh, raise money as fast as we can and also get this printed and get the lawn signs and stickers and flyers and all that good stuff. Um, and also, if you're willing to post on your front porch forum, it, it, that's like, we can't afford their rates for like, for campaign ads. Um, <laughs> it's better, besides it's better if it's like, you know, if, if, it's, if it's us doing it. It's like for, for the people, by the people. So. I have like a, a question if you covered something, and if you didn't, I was wondering if I might be able to comment. So the question is, did you talk at all about the opposition No, but uh, somebody brought that up earlier. So, Liz? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say. Speaker, uh, microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one right there. I got my yeah. dog in there. No, there's oh. nothing. It's an empty <laughs> mic stand. Oh, it is? Yeah, we're just yelling. Shall I just stand? OK, this microphone is totally sufficient. OK, you'll be fine. Right. Go ahead, Liz. Yeah, you can. You go. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that the whole waterfront, as I understand it, hinged on a citizen ballot initiative that they're going to say, think, that the city council put out there. But the city, this is the way I understand it. The city council voted to develop the waterfront and then it said, well, wait a minute, we better go out to the people and ask if they really want this. And when they did, they found out they didn't. Yeah. So thank goodness the people yeah. had a say because we would all be living in an entirely different city. Yeah. So, so it was a referendum, That's, you're right. So, and you know what else, like it's also an example that maybe we, we still remember is Burlington Telecom actually was established through the ballot, like the majority of Burlingtonians wanted to have a city-owned telecommunication infrastructure. But if you look at how we lost it, the decisions were made behind closed doors. Like they, they didn't, the, the entity that they sold Burlington Telecom to did not even exist until the day after the decision. That's how like messed up like the process is. But because we are, we are so uneducated and our leaders don't educate themselves or us about the referendum process, it could have played out differently. The night of the decision that to, to sell Burlington Telecom to a private entity, the next day we could have gone out and collected 2,000 signatures to, put, to force the same thing that, that Liz was talking about, to force that decision to put that on a referendum. And nobody, like even, even the mayor, like the Democrats, Nobody liked the way Burlington Telecom decision went down, but we are, we've been so like uneducated about it. Like it wasn't even in anybody's radar. When I first learned about referendum, I was like, "Oh, we already have this power. Why don't anybody talk about it?" What they did tell us is like there's going to be a 60-day quiet period, 
when in, ter in truth, like what that is, is we do have 60 days to collect 2,000 signatures and put that on the referendum, but they don't call it a referendum period, they call it a quiet period. So. <laughs> people with money are going to like use that money to promote ballot items and then get people to pass them yeah. like that already happens right. and the the current administration formed a pack and worked with big business interests to put a ballot item on for the downtown improvement district and then they spent a massive amount of money to try to pass that and we defeated it by organizing without the money and so i just want to raise that point that under the current system the people who have power can do that so why can't everyone have that? Right. And, if, and if people are going to spend money to pass an item, then if people oppose it, we either have to raise money or just organize and go out and talk to our neighbors and defeat it like we did with Downtown Improvement District. But I just think it's important to like make that point because pe people are stoking fear around this idea of giving like power to the mob. And that's not <laughs> what this is. You know, This is about empowering people at a time in history when we've been incredibly disempowered and we need to heal as a community and we should be bringing people together right now, not dividing us over fear of the changes that need to happen. So that's all. I just wanted to make that point because I think it's an important argument that you may need to defend this and, and that's a good thing to bring So like, yeah, money is already playing it's a part, there, yeah. yeah. And I just want to quickly tag on, Free, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Winooski is working on things like, for example, like do you create criteria for who can be an election, yeah, or sorry, there, yeah, to who can be a signature collector, so you can make sure it's not like some out of town moneyed interest that's like running around getting signatures and paying people to get signatures, you can make sure it's Burlingtonians collecting signatures for Burlingtonians. So the process could definitely be more streamlined and we are using, we know, we're hoping like the next step is either the city council will, will propose this or we can propose it, that the process be so that before the signatures are even collected, we basically, we, we, we register as petition taker with the city clerk and city attorney. So they also get to see uh, and, and, and correct and like work with us to develop what the language of the petition is going to be. And that happens before we even go out to collect uh, this petition. Uh, Winooski already had, has this figured out and we just have to follow their lead. And the, the, the legislature already approved that as well. Yeah. Democratic yeah. Aspect of Prop Zero. yeah. So that's like that's like that's the kind of ordinance like that would regulate. It would it would basically say you need to be a Burlingtonian or like even like Chittenden County. And so we will have like who can actually we know who's taking this. Who, we know who's collecting the signatures. Or like campaign donation caps or something yeah. like that. So sure. Yeah. And I mean honestly, it should be not just with the petition ballot question, but any ballot question. So we know who is like giving like the mayor mayor's pack. All this money to pass them all, or like you know, or like to uh, to oppose the police uh, uh, oversight board. But she created a pack board. Right. He, he there is a pack that he created. Like we don't know. Like it's, it's a pop up pack. <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna have we're not gonna have the the, the numbers until after the election. Aspen. How how can someone who's interested get involved? Uh. So. Uh, you can come see me uh, or also put your info on uh, the sign up sheet and we can reach out to you. But we have like online organizing. You're welcome to join us, um, especially as like the heat of the next two weeks <laughs> as we're making this happen. So we'll definitely need help with people posting your front porch forum. Also flyering around town will be um, really helpful and also things like lawn signs and that kind of thing as well. Infinite.
Yeah, Infinite was uh, involved in uh, the re trying to revive the NPA All Ward, which is the you know the the, the gathering of all the different NPAs as a method of uh, decision making that is directly democratic, and that is so. So like each NPA already have that, but then we need like a citywide assembly of the of the different NPAs. So and it needs power. It needs to have their resolution right now. NPAs can re pass resolution, and it's only advisory. Um, most of the time, it's just for the administration to get their project, proposed project, rubber stamped. Um, it doesn't really have any like real power. Although when the mayor tried to sell Memorial Auditorium, I, I think that's when like the All Ward NPA got revived. Um, it, w it was able just through its moral like power, like it was able to like slow that process down, and and we've so far we've been able to keep the uh, Memorial Auditorium. But they, they will probably try that again next time. Um, thank you. So, so the last, I think the last ballot question that we, we're going to talk about is the community control of the police or independent police oversight. Um, and I just want to start with uh, just a little story uh, that I as somebody who lived in Burlington for over 25 years and have an interest in the police uh, not hurting people. I, uh, often we, we, we see all this, uh, you know, all this like uh, scandalous uh, violence that uh, happens in other states, but we also have the police violence in Burlington. Uh, although that's the one that dominates the media, uh, there is actually a more, um, a more insidious type of police violence that we don't usually know about, uh, that we don't see in the media or even aware is happening. Um, in September last year, this is just one example, I witnessed the police um, stop a man, uh, and this was in, during downtown, in, in downtown during the weekend, uh, they had the Vermont State Police officers uh, help su supplement the, the police force to, to patrol downtown. So uh, the night was, uh, there was no incidents until around two o'clock when the police stopped a man who, it was pretty clear this man was struggling, like he had some mental health issue, um, but they stopped him, and this was this is on camera. Like, if you look in WCAX, you'll see like what I recorded. What happened is like so they stopped him, and when the, he demanded to know why he was being stopped, the police would not give him the reason. And instead of de-escalating the situation, they kept pushing him, right? And they kept pushing him until um, eventually four or five officers surrounded this, this man, and he, he's a black man, he, and they tackled him, and uh, it is in front of 200 people, like watching this incident. They dragged him to their car and stripped his pants down, so he was naked from the waist down, and, and put him in the car, in, in their cruiser, and took, took off. Um, so, I recorded this incident and I, I, and I filed a police complaint. But what so what? But I, I really want to talk about though is what happens two days after that. So after they booked him, they released him because they couldn't actually. They didn't really have any reason to uh, to detain him, and they definitely did not charge him because he didn't really do anything. He was he was be, he was standing his ground. So, but because he was already struggling with mental health issues, that the the act of being humiliated in front of a crowd so triggered him that this man was then found like, assaulting somebody. And witnesses described the, uh, this man as being dissociative. So if they didn't have a reason to arrest him, to charge him, after, after that happened, now they did because he, like, when he, escal he they escalated him so that he actually ended up assaulting somebody and now he's in prison waiting for trial. And so it's, it's the kind of things that happens here. It's the kind of treatment that is not just people of color, but poor people also. 
and I have that wasn't even the, the only like incidents that I it's just the most recent one that I, I just happened to have my camera with me and I was able to record when I was uh, serving food at Sears Lane when they got evicted I saw this kind of treatment over and over again they don't escalate they actually escalate so that there is reason for them to, to deploy violence um, the, most of these officers they don't live in Burlington they live somewhere else so they don't really have to deal with the aftermath. They don't really have to deal with the impact of their action. But as people who live in Burlington, this is like, it's up to us. We have to deal with the, with, with the aftermath. We have to deal with, you know, the trauma. Um, and it's just, it's just one of those things that I, I feel the police, especially in Burlington, has, they've been operating with a culture of impunity. And I do think it has to do with the administration and his supporters' unwillingness to hold the police accountable. Six months into the Weinberger administration, there was a nonviolent civil disobedience uh, protesting the meeting of New England go uh, governor uh, that, that happened. And the Burlington police officers opened fire on peace, like nonviolent protesters. Burlington was shocked. There was an outrage, like we called for independent investigation. And this was one of the choices that Miro had to make. And he said, no, he refused to do independent investigation. A few months after that, Wayne Burnett, somebody who was experiencing mental health crisis, his mom called the cops. They showed up within two minutes. They had him shot dead. Then, like this was in 2013, I think. We called for unarmed response. Then we wanted an armed response. Then the, the, what we call now the CSL or the CSOs, we've been asking for that for at least ten years, and it's now it's like somehow, you know, the chief has like innovated this thing that we've been asking for for ten years, and we and it kept happening. There are more people who died at the hand of the police under this administration than all the previous administration in Burlington's history combined. After Wayne Burnett, there was Phil Grennan. Same, almost same story. Somebody who's, who, who, who's experiencing a mental health crisis. We had a new chief and Del Pozo, but instead of, instead of like, and he, he's very, he, was, he was very good at talking, at like saying what people wanna hear about the escalation. But what happened is he actually escalated, like the chief actually, he himself, uh, this guy had retreated into his bathroom and had hiding, it was hiding from the police because he said like, I have these visions of me being uh, killed by the police. So he ran away from the police, went into his bathroom and stayed there. And sure enough, like the police, instead of just leaving him alone or like ha having a social worker deal with that, uh, the chief actually went back to his house, get a drill so he, they could drill a camera into his bathroom to, to monitor this guy. Yeah, Phil Grandin. Yeah. So I mean, I people who have been like, like who live in Burlington for a while, they they know this. Uh, so and Del Pozo was supposed to be like the, the philosopher chief. He's like he's the good liberal like police chief, but he like he went to his house to get the drill, so they could like sneak in a, like a, a camera to monitor this guy. That's not what the escalation looked like. <laughs> And the, unfortunately, the lessons learned, like what we got out of that incident, is the ERV vehicle, the, the, the ambulance looking uh, police, uh, like cruisers that you have with all the tools. It was a million dollar vehicle. What's that? It was a million dollar vehicle. Yeah, well, I think it's like 350 something thousand. But that's one, that was one of the justification was that, so in case anything like Phil Grennan ever happened again, the chief doesn't have to run to his basement to grab his drill. Like all, everything is gonna be there in this car. That's Wayne Burnett. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phil Grennan is like the the guy who was living. Where was he living in one of the uh, housing? The house street. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, he was on South Square. Park. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, even the Vermont, actually, the, the governor had like something to say about that. So I, and we had like on Elmwood, there was another. So police involved shooting. It was the feds this time, and supposedly it was a drug dealer. And even if you support executing drug dealers on the spot, 
I think the BPD, as the local enforcement agency, they had a responsibility to evacuate the area. Um, so there was a near miss. This guy, uh, I think Stephen Ke Kelly, Kelly was his name, Ken Kenneth Stevens. He was supposedly a drug dealer, and they, the feds went in, a a T uh, DEA went in and killed him. But in the process, his neighbors, who was like sitting in his couch uh, in the house next to him, had a bullet went through his living room and missed him by an inch. I think BPD, even if this, it wasn't their operation, they have an obligation to clear out the area if they really are there to protect Burlingtonians. That was a near miss. That was uh, seven years ago. And uh, you would hope that we'd learn a lesson, but if you read, uh, read the news or like you know about the, uh, the Manhattan Drive shooting, that's the same thing happened. Like by an inch, somebody missed, like almost got killed. Oh, sitting in his car. Right? Sitting in his car. So, it, and it's interesting like how like this near misses happen in the old North End, right? It's not, it doesn't happen if it was in like Summit Street or on the hill section, it, it wouldn't happen there. It's like they don't, do they care about us? If like what, who are they really protecting? And we have like another like mental health uh, crisis that end in death with Doug Philbin, who was trying to see his wife in the hospital and ended up being punched like to death by police officer. We had um, a, a mom who was try who, want who called the cops because he she wanted to teach a, teach a lesson to he to her son who was you know who who shoplifted some vapes ended up getting ketamine injection. <laughs> and and the, la the latest scandal is how we spent $20 million on our police department, but when you call, they can't do anything, nobody shows up. But Riverwatch Homeowners Association contracted directly with the Burlington Police Officers Association to provide security there. So if you want the police to show up, in addition to the tax money that we're already paying, there's $80 an hour on top of that to ensure that they show up in city car wearing, wearing police uniform uh, to deal with your security issues. <laughs> they, yeah, and that's all, and, they're con and we only know of this one contract, I think because they, they're so, uh, the culture of impunity is so such that they have the HOA, like which is a private business, send the check to the, the payroll for, for Burlington Police Department to be processed. And so that's how it became city business, right? But in reality, there's, like, there's no way to know what actually happens between the, any HOA and the Burlington Police Officers Association because those are between two private entities. So when when there when people say people we distrust the police like these are the reasons and like and I'm like I'm not even un, impacted by the violence all that much. Um, Did you go to the Melly Brothers? So the Melly Brothers like I like so like, right now because that's still that's still in in uh, in trial right like that's like the the court the, the court is still in court. The Melly Brothers you wanna you wanna. So the, I, I don't know if you know about the Melly Brothers they were. Um, you can see the, the, the video there, the, the body cam video. The, the Melly brothers were these two brothers, like they were uh, hanging out in, a, what is it, what ails you? And there was uh, the, was it Joe Coro? Who's, was that the, the, the officers or? Campbell, yeah, okay. Was it Campbell? Yeah, so. Coro was watching, you would actually. Coro was, yeah, so Joe Coro, who's now the police, uh, officer Association's president. This is this is what happens. This is this is what happens too. Like, what happens when when the police is we we have him on camera beating up these two brothers, and it even results in like in like permanent injury. The the Melly brothers, one of them was going to be an engineer, and now they are like permanently disabled because of the injury. That's our people. That's our neighbors. Um, and we have Joe Coro, who is on camera, be, seen being ve really violent with with uh, with civilians. And instead of losing his job, he only got two weeks suspension, which is less than what they 
punish the two officers who stole, like who ate, who drank the beer that they confiscated. There were two officers who drank the beer that they confiscated. They got three weeks of suspension. <laughs> um, so, and if you don't know if you, about the fraternal order, order of the police, I, I suggest you look it up and see the parent organizations of the police union. They are right-wing, like Trump-loving, uh, anti-Black Lives Matter organization. They're not a union. They, they, won't, they, don't, they claim not to be a union, and, but they enjoy all this protection. Uh, they fundraise uh, for Derek Chauvin, like, the, like all these cops we see in other states killing people, like their trial, they, they fundraise for those, those, those cops. And this is the people we are entrusting our public safety with. They, they hate us. They, they, they hate Burlington. They hate our values. How can we trust them? And that's why I think it's really important for, for us to have police oversight. I don't just hate the police. I have family members who are police officers. Um, there's definitely a mentality there that I notice. Like when, when other cops are around, they definitely change. But I do have relatives who are police officers. I think it's, it's, uh, it's irresponsible for us to just have people who are empowered to take life, to injure us, even permanently, uh, and to be investigating themselves. It's irresponsible. So, I'm sorry, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to correct, should I use the mic for that one? Okay, thanks for uh, This is just for that camera. Uh, I wanted to correct something you said, but then you contradicted yourself that even though the violence doesn't always directly affect someone personally, in reality, like, I feel your passion and like, this you know swell of angst that I'm sure everyone in this room feels too that violence against anyone affects all of us personally you know so it's not just happening to one person it's happening to entire communities um, I wanted to relate a little bit of uh, my personal experience I'm from a suburb outside Philadelphia and my dealings with the police there have always been horrendous um, recently uh, a fight with my dad that like you know things happen. Um, police had been called before and actually had helped me lead me to better services to like check in with someone because I'm going through a lot. I admit to sometimes having some mental health issues going with like some physical stuff I'm dealing with. Uh, but this time around when they came I was immediately slapped in cuffs charged as a felon for trying to murder my father. We had to go through this several month process with my parents hiring a lawyer, them sitting behind me in court on the day with the arresting officer on the other side while I'm waiting for a fucking major surgery, you know, so I can like get my airways opened up and I'm writing to a police officer who became the chief that used to run with us in high school. So like there are less subtle forms of violence, not just immediate like life and death matters, but things that a lot of people are dealing with. Like I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, I remember learning sometime many years after I had been given a misdemeanor for a very like innocuous flyer when I was a kid, a uh, teenager that they had a policy that we want the police to issue as many summary offenses and misdemeanors as possible. It makes us look good if we have a high count, you know, that denotes to like whoever that they're doing a good job, the more of these tickets that they hand out, um, which obviously is like completely inverted and, you know, wrong thinking. So I just wanna ask like in terms of civilian oversight, not just to be aware that like, you know, very obvious forms of police violence like life or death matters aren't being addressed but also these more subtle things like somebody getting slapped with a fine over something innocuous misdemeanors summary offenses those are all very like subtle forms of violence that can play out pushing many people or like the police not doing something when they should. yeah when things could be very easily de-escalated um, i always remember this book i read many years ago called verbal judo uh, where this English teacher became a cop himself and started going around like from police department to police department educating these officers how they can just talk somebody down with communication. Um, yes, so police in other countries manage to provide security for their communities without weapons, without killing people, yeah. using their wits. Um, yeah, can I, you talk more about like what civilian oversight well, so, like? and I So civilian oversight, this is like, so just to step back here and, and just to be fair to the, to the police officers who are, who are actually serving this community it's unfortunately like the failure is at the policy level when when we use the police to deal with the symptoms of inequity 
which is what this is what what it is. It's like the housing policies is a failure. You know, the economic policies are failure. So we have homelessness. Um, you know, we have people who are on the brink of homelessness. People are desperate. Uh, and increasingly, like we just rely on the police to solve all these policy failures. Right. So uh, to, to address the root cause is like the, 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 the way we fix this is actually let's fix the, the economic policy. Like we, we fix the, at the root. We fix prop, poverty, uh, addiction, homelessness. That's what we need to fix. But this civilian oversight for now and it's not going to change the world. It, it does do some harm reduction. And that's kind of the idea. Like we want the police to be accountable to us. Um, and we, we know, so I've just described to you like, like examples of harm that's been done in this community, but there has never been acknowledgement by any of the chiefs that harm has been done, let alone an apology, which I think would have gone a long way. We would, like that in, in, in terms of building trust, rebuilding trust, and like healing the community, just acknowledging that harm was done, and that, uh, you know, they, even if they don't have to apologize, although that would be great, I just, just acknowledge that it's done and like we're doing something about it. So most of the oversight is uh, in that spirit of harm reduction. We don't. We want to make sure that people aren't targeted based on their race or their economic status, um, and mental or mental health status. Yes. So uh, thank you, Barb. So, and if not, you know, I, I think it's worth also adding that it's a failure of our mayor. Yes. Um, to supervise the chief and that the department. It is the official, one of the official duties of the mayor of Burlington is to serve as the chief peace officer of the city. And he has failed at that miserably. Yes. So it, it, it's not just the department, it's all around across the board. I don't think uh, he has uh, the courage to hold that department accountable. Yeah. We, I mean, he, I, I agree. I, I think if we look at Miro's actions, like we can't trust him to address systemic racism in his, under his own administration. Uh, when we have a really good, strong leader, Taisha Green, who was hired to be the uh, director of uh, racial equity and in inclusion and belonging, um, and she had the trust of a lot of leaders in this community, she was in, Miro initially put her in charge uh, of the police transformation, but because of the pushback uh, from police and their supporters, he decided to, to replace her with the director of the Burlington Electric Department, who's a white man. Um, so, supervision of the consultant Right. So, and, you know, it's, and we, it, it's, it's, he's like, we can't trust Miro, like, to do this. It's almost like the, the Burlington Police Department is like where people, with, with officers with bullying problem or with anger problem. They go there and then they fail up. Del Pozo is now like a consultant for police reform. Uh, he's like, he teaches at Yale, you know, he's like, it, it's, and you know, like, recently, like the, the latest one is Jen Morrison, who has failed to take racial uh, incident seriously. And she's now our state's public commissioner of, uh, of safety. Um, it, it has to, like, all this like, uh, accountability, it matters, and then it impacts our state as a whole. Uh, Sherling was in charge of uh, the police when they shot at pro protesters, but because Miro went out of his way to shield him from in independent investigation, uh, he never had, what, we were never able to hold him accountable. When uh, Doug Finbins, after Doug Finbins' de death was de determined uh, by the state's coroner as a homicide caused by the police, he ran interference. He tried to influence. He tried to get the state to change that uh, instead of from homicide to having a, a, what, what was it like a, the existing condition. He, we can't trust. Not it's not just Miro either. It's actually like you know like Joan Shannon has been like a strong supporter of the police and she's been in the city council for even longer than that. Um, she also asked Miro to get her daughter a job there. It's like the, 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 the conflict of interest between people who like support the police and like and John Sanders also sold Del Pozo his house before he became a chief like by influencing like the council decision to hire him. It's, 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 it's incredible to me that we don't hear about this and we don't call them out. Um, I mean I don't care like that <laughs> but it's so uh, if, 
Any question about the, the ballot question itself? Amy, you want to say something? Well, just on the point that I feel like the thing that you hear from a lot of people is like, okay, okay, we hear you, so we'll work on it. And um, I just want us to be careful of like hearing that promise and believing it. Uh, because for example, um, so on uh, Monday, the city council um, held, well, they had their meeting and uh, they proposed a resolution that basically said like, voters don't vote for this. And we promise that we're gonna create something after. Um, and one of the big, there's a number of really problematic things that were stated on that resolution. A lot of things were misleading and some of it like completely false. Uh, but um, I think the other, the other really important point that Councillor Bergman pointed out is that uh, one of their big points was there wasn't enough community feedback and engagement in the creation of this petition, which I wanna call out that in 2020, when it became aware that, uh, oh, it's the problem is that the city charter makes it so that only the police chief can has the disciplinary authority, right? So they realized that in 2020, the mayor was like, this is a monopoly of power. It's an aberration in our democratic system. We will have to change it. And I promise that we'll do something about it. Nothing got done. Um, well, sorry, they basically, they, they brought this petition or they brought this proposal. It, it spent time in the charter change committee. It then went to public forum and like city council where they listened to hundreds of hours of people talking about this, including one night on December 7th when they had 150 people alone that night call in in support of this proposal, right? Then the city council itself passed it in seven to five vote and then the mayor vetoed it, right? And then not since then the mayor's done nothing, right? So um, the reason I, and, and at that point, this group of folks like picked it up. We talked to lots of people and got 2,000 signatures to get on the ballot. So this has gone, it's, it's like blatantly inflammatory to say that this has not seen community engagement. It's seen probably way more community engagement than a lot of things that are on this ballot. Uh, and also, the point of getting to is, if you look at their timeline for them coming up with their proposal, they're like, we're gonna do this and we're gonna come up with a new proposal in two months. So you're, you're gonna get more communication than we've gotten in two years, in two months. So just, I would say, be cautious when you're listening to these narratives of like, just wait, just wait, we'll fix that. If, if it was a good faith objection, like the ballot process also allowed them, they, they know this language, they could have actually also put forward a ballot proposal that would address all this objection, that would put some guardrails uh, against what they're, they're being concerned about. Uh, they could do that, but I don't think they're, they're arguing in good faith because they just say, don't vote for this. And that's not, that, that, that tells us like, you don't really care. To me, it's like, the question is really, do black lives matter? Like, do, do homeless lives matter? Like, do, we, do, do poor people have the same rights to be protected as people who can afford a house or afford private security? That's the, that's the real question. That's the real ballot question for me is that. We, uh, as a city, we would be the first to like paint in big letters, Black Lives Matter. But what does that even mean? Like when it comes to police oversight, they go out of their way to prevent this from happening. Thank you for coming here. If you have more questions, please uh, talk to me, talk to Amy. Uh, please talk to your neighbors. We do need, we do need public safety. But please, so if you go to onemillionexperiments.com, you can see what other communities have done uh, in terms of public safety that are not based on the police, not based on state violence. And I think Burlington should be in the, on that list. Please check out the site, onemillionexperiment.com, and please talk to your neighbors. We, 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 do need we do need public safety. We need to put the public, though, in control of public safety. Thanks. Same question from the uh, make sure you leave your uh, in contact information uh, over there. There is a sign-up sheet. You can also uh, you can also give me a call or give Amy a call. My my name is Farid. 802-272-8339. You could also contact uh, at propositionzero.org is the website. Thank you for coming. And please, there is there is still a lot of food. Please take some home. Thank you.